Good evening to you. Good morning for me. Um, my name is Bradley Tonneson, and I'm from New Mexico, so southern part of the U.S. in between Texas, Arizona, right above Mexico. And I, uh, I'm here to talk to you about lessons I've had from seed saving for local adaptation and creating a participatory plant breeding program in New Mexico. So a little about myself. Um, actually, I've been told my last name is Norwegian, so half of my genes are happy to visit home, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, I got my PhD in plant pathology at Colorado State University. I studied genetic reasons for resistance to diseases in rice, specifically. So I did some collaboration with the Philippines and breeding some disease resistant rice over there. And I've been in between there and here, uh, managing a small organic farm, doing seed saving practices there, composting, et cetera. But now I'm in the Department of Extension. So if you don't know what Extension is, it's a program in the US in which uh, state schools like ours in New Mexico, um, we disseminate research and new knowledge in agriculture to the public. So we do a lot of outreach activities and workshops and applied research for the needs of the region. And also the, uh, the participatory plant breeding program that we do is funded by Western SARE, S-A-R-E, which stands for Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. So this is a USDA funded program uh, to help support sustainable agriculture efforts and supporting small farmers, small landholders, things like that. So without further ado, I'll get into it. And let's make sure this is all going and I'll get my little laser pointer out. Okay, um, here we go. So this workshop is going to have four different parts. I think each one of these parts is really critical uh, to understand plant breeding in itself and also the importance of plant breeding for local adaptation. I think since we have such a small group, we can go through each section and take a break in between each one. Uh, I can answer some questions. We can discuss uh, what I have talked about and then we can move on to the next one. So in the first part, I wanna talk about genetics and genomes. For some people, this could be very basic, but I think understanding how DNA works is really imperative um, when you're making crosses and you're developing new varieties of plants. And then we'll get into plant breeding methods in the second section. So how actually do you start with some genetically diverse population? Uh, how do you develop a variety that's adapted to a specific area or has a specific trait? And then the third section is gonna be on a new concept in science called epigenetics, which really stresses the importance of the environment on how the plant reacts and how it can actually change things that are inherited into the next generation. So it's really important in terms of seed saving in your local area and breeding um, in a participatory plant breeding program within your region, um, how important it is in terms of this new uh, science that we're learning. And then finally, I'll get into lessons I've learned starting up our program and some case studies, some projects we're working on, and also some advice on how to start up a program and how to manage it. So let's get started. First section, genetics and genomes. So we'll start off with the most simple thing. What is a gene? So it comes from the Greek word gen to beget, to give birth. And what do we know about a gene? Well, we talk about eye color genes or hair color genes or curly hair genes. Um, in plants, it could be the color of fruit, the color of the flower. Those are the really simple things that we talk about in terms of what a gene controls. And essentially in science, we call this a unit of heredity. So 
you can think of it as data transfer from one generation to the next or holding unique qualities. Is it biological wisdom passed down to the next generation? And also that it's a source of diversity. So how did we get to thinking about what a gene is? So it started, actually Darwin had a theory of pangenesis here on the left. And pangenesis, what he thought was going on when we passed on um, our inheritance to the next generation was that everything that happened in our entire bodies or an entire plant's body uh, would send information to the germ cells, which would be the sperm, the egg, the pollen, or the egg and the plant. And that information would then be collected and transferred to the next generation, to the offspring. And so this theory was essentially that new information throughout the entire organism's life was given to what would be passed on. And this was sort of thrown out later on as we learned a little bit more about DNA and how that actually holds the information. But we will get to the fact that we actually have turned a little bit back to the pangenesis theory with epigenetics, but preview for later things. Um, but now we're working with germplasm theory, which is the germ cells hold the information and the offspring get half of that from one parent, half from the other parent, and that's all you receive. Whatever happens to the organism throughout its lifetime doesn't change anything. And so that's been the thought for modern conventional plant breeding, uh, for modern genetics. We just use DNA as the sole holder of information. And so yeah, what is DNA? I'm sure we've seen this, but it's a, uh, it is a molecule that holds um, the code for producing everything that happens within a cell. And it com is composed of these three different elements of the code, uh, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So those are like ladders. They are steps on the ladder of this double helix molecule called DNA. And the code works with the A's always binding with T's. C is always binding with Gs. So adenine, thymine, cytosine, to guanine. And this is really useful uh, for replication, which I'll get to. So DNA, you've seen this before, I'm sure, but it is composed into a chromosome, which is a long strand of DNA. And that's within the nucleus of a cell. And there are thousands and millions of cells within an organism. And so each cell has a copy of all the DNA and the structure of the DNA is really the interesting thing, uh, that it is these two nucleotides or bases, the C to G, A to T, um, on the steps of this ladder that can be split for easy replication. And so I won't get into this figure at all, but I just wanna show you that understanding this concept, how DNA can be split, and then each side of it uh, rebuilt to create copies of it, is how we can do plant breeding and how we can breed for certain genetics because it's being copied and passed on to the next generation from each parent. So inheritance stems from the fact that DNA can replicate in this way. Okay, so what does DNA do? It's a blueprint for life, all right? It, a gene in itself is a segment of DNA and it holds instructions based on how its code is laid out to build specific proteins and enzymes that carry out actions in the cell. And that's the whole organism. You look over here to the right and Rubisco, so this is the most abundant enzyme on earth. And it is the one that will help fix carbon dioxide into sugars in the plant. And this enzyme is built from multiple genes. So the genes create the proteins that are little subunits that are put together to form this complex enzyme. So genes produce these proteins that do these actions. And sometimes the plant might want to produce more rubisco than other moments of its lifetime. So these genes can actually be turned on and off. I like this uh, analogy of 
a small music box where you can turn it on and your gene is this metal cylinder with all these bumps on it. And when you turn it on, it plays the song. But when you don't want to hear that song anymore, you can just turn it off. And genes work the same way. Another analogy for genes is that it could be like written software or a strict program. So if you turn it on, it'll do this action. And then you turn it off, and it won't. And there are environmental cues that will cause it to turn on and off. So we'll zoom out now to the entire genome. So when we say genome, that means all the DNA and every single gene that an organism contains. So for example, when we uh, talk about what a genome would do, um, it's complex to produce anything inside an organism. And for example, you know, we do a lot of work with chili pepper in New Mexico. Uh, so we're pretty familiar with the formation of capsaicin. And capsaicin is the compound that makes peppers hot. Um, I'm not sure how much you like spicy food there, but we love it here. And it takes 30 plus genes involved. Um, and if you look at this diagram, at the bottom here is capsaicin. So that is the molecule. But at the start, we, we start with amino acids. So phenylalanine and valine. And those have to be converted step by step with all of these arrows into capsaicin. Each one of these steps, each one of these small arrows is a different enzyme. Like this one, PAL, phenylalanine ammoniolase, converts phenylalanine to cinnamate. And there are multiple genes that produce proteins to make that enzyme, PAL. And there's 30 plus genes involved in creation of all of these different enzymes to make that happen. So just a snapshot of how complex uh, the action of these genes are within the organism, just to produce one compound. And now to zoom out, how many genes actually are there in particular species? So in this column here, we have different crops. And in genetics, we have these reference genomes for certain things. Uh, rice, um, Arabidopsis thaliana, so that is a wild mustard. So this would essentially be our reference to a brassica species. Um, and we got tomato, poplar, which is our reference for trees, and corn, pepper, barley. So the total number of genes in each of these, they vary but it's tens of thousands, up to 40,000. And the genome size is pretty immense and it varies quite a bit across these species. So when I say MB here in this column and GB here, so MB is megabases, so steps on that DNA ladder, right? Adenine or thymine, what have you. Um, a megabase is one million of those whereas a gigabase is one billion. So you look here at barley and it's huge. And the reason is, is because plants, their genomes, um, they often like to duplicate them, combine them together, they can handle that. Animals can't so much, but plants tend to be loose with their DNA. And, and so there's a lot of quote unquote empty space in the genome, because you look here uh, for barley, 39,000 genes. And if you do the math, there's about 2,000 bases per gene. Uh, so out of the 4.8 gigabases, only about a 40th, 1 40th of the total DNA is genes. So there is a whole bunch of space in between, and that works as scaffolding to support the positioning of certain genes so they can produce proteins better. Um, there are certain patterns and regulatory elements that change how genes are turned on and turned off. So there's a lot of complexity there. And I just want you to think about that when you're, when you're breeding on your own farm, that it's pretty immense here. You're not just looking at 
you know, trying to get a single gene in there that makes your fruit a certain color. It's uh, much more complex. So now we'll get on to how genomes change over time, right? So for this one, this uh, stems from my work in rice in the past. And um, this was a project where they sequenced, so they got the DNA sequence of all the elements of the code for 3,000 different varieties of rice. And they grouped them based on the relatedness or how similar their code was to each other. And they ended up producing these six different clades. So they labeled them with different colors and they found that there was a lot of differences between them, 2.4 million uh, specifically. So the interesting thing about this is when they grouped them, then they looked at where did each one of these come from? And you look here in Southeast Asia, up in the Japan area and through India, um, there are different types, right? For instance, up here, we have temperate Japonica, which is up here near Japan, Korea. And in that one is its own clade, right? Over here in this blue clade. Whereas the Indicas up here in the green clade, they're all coming from um, this area in Southeast Asia. And it gets a little more specific for certain ones. But what you're seeing is that the genome looks different as it's coming from different areas. Now, this could be a pretty simple concept, but it's interesting to think about because that's just the result of seed saving and breeding from farmers over thousands and thousands of years. Wherever the seed originated from, it was passed on to other people, traveled across the ocean sometimes, and as they grew it out, all they were doing was picking the seed from the best looking plants. And what eventually resulted 10,000 years later were these very distinct different types of genomes that were localized to those certain areas. So that's evolution. And that's also human directed evolution. So it's plant breeding. So how are these changes happening over time? Well, it's the result of mutations and there's a lot of ways that mutations happen to DNA um, and it's all environmental. So sometimes uh, the DNA can have replication errors. So when it's splitting in two and rebuilding itself, errors happen. Um, there are these elements in the genome that are big chunks, um, kind of like illustrated here, that they will be removed from one area and popped in another area. And that can either be right in the middle of a gene, which will affect the protein that it makes. Um, viruses oftentimes introduce foreign DNA into the genome, and sometimes it stays there. Um, abiotic events, so, you know, ultraviolet light can cause mutations, things like that. Um, and the most important one for breeding in our projects is sexual reproduction. So the production of gametes, the production of sperm and egg, um, it's a process in which uh, DNA is switched around. And so that's why each offspring of an individual is different. So what the genome provides, it provides adaptation to the environment. So it could be temperature, water, soil, air, but also life. So the genome provides a lot of proteins and activities that will help in interorganism communication. So microbial symbiosis, beneficial um, organisms in the soil or on the leaf, um, fungal symbiosis like mycorrhizae, um, pollinator attraction. So the uh, volatile compounds produced from flowering plants to attract certain pollinators, that's dictated by some genes. Deterring pests, so the production of compounds that will keep a caterpillar from feeding on it. Um, disease resistance in general too. So the genome's involved in all of these different traits. So now I wanna give you a little case study of what 
uh, the genome does in response to something like a plant disease. Um, my degree is in plant pathology, so I like to talk about this a little bit. Um, so in this little figure, you have a chili uh, that's been planted, and this is its nice taproot. But during the summertime, we have some fungal uh, and bacterial root diseases. Um, in this case, it's fungal um, that infect the roots of the plant, especially when it's warm and wet. And when those conditions meet, so if a farmer overwaters their field in the middle of summer, this can happen. Um, it activates uh, the fungus to start growing its hyphae toward the root. It can sense it and move towards it. And then it'll hit the surface of the root of that plant and start penetrating the cells on the surface of the root and start breaking down the tissue. And eventually what you'll see is a, is a chili plant that looks like it's in drought stress, like it's dying because it's not getting water. The reason is, is because the roots have been destroyed by this pathogen. And so what happens, how does the plant fight off these kind of infections? So it's complex, but it's also, it's similar to a human immune system. Um, just like antibodies, there are these molecules, these receptors on the surface of plant cells here. And these are able to sense molecules on the surface of different pathogens, like bacterial pathogens, you know that tail on a lot of um, single-celled organisms, the flagellum. So there's a particular protein on that that's able to be sensed by the plant cell. Also, the compound um, known as chitin, that's on the surface of insects and fungi, and it's able to sense those as well. And what it does is activate a cascade of signaling, so um, which will activate all of these defense response genes. And the genes are producing proteins involved in a lot of different things, like uh, hormones that are sent across the plant, so it warns the entire plant that an infection is coming, um, strengthens the cell wall, so buildup of lignin, you know, like the, the woody material in trees, individual plant cells can produce that more and it keeps the fungus from penetrating it. So it's hardening its shell. Um, also peroxides, you know, like hydrogen peroxide to disinfect. Um, it'll secrete those kind of molecules to kill whatever is attacking. What they'll also do is, is have localized cell death. So they will, they will trigger a response to tell every plant cell within an area to die. And in doing so, leaves no food or living material for the pathogen to eat. So all these different things are dictated by the activation of these genes. So you've got to have good ones that are activating quick and are effective in order for this to actually happen. So a closer look at what mutations can do to this kind of defense response. So I talked about PAL before. Uh, this little enzyme changes phenylalanine to cinnamate, um, but downstream it can also diverge on this tree of all this activity uh, to produce materials that make lignin. So like I said, the strengthening of the plant cell wall um, to keep fungus from getting in. So in rice, there is a mutation, a natural mutation that has occurred that uh, this big chunk of DNA is just deleted. What happens is then this protein that it produces doesn't work. So PAL doesn't work very well or at all. Um, and these two different types of this gene, this is really important uh, for breeding is this term allele. So an allele is a variant of a particular gene. So we have this allele, which is a functional gene. And then we have this allele which is a non-functional gene. And what happens, you know, I'm in science, so I'm giving you more data. Sorry, this is the last bar figure. Oh, actually, no, there's one more, sorry. <laughs> but um, this one is just, all I wanna get you to get from this is that uh, the lesion score, so that's like the amount of disease. Uh, the amount of disease is less when the rice plant has 
the functional allele, so the good allele. Um, when it's infected with all different types of rice pathogens. So it's just showing that the mutation of one gene can have a pretty profound effect. And that's why it's important to breed for these good alleles. So in summary, um, genes are units of heredity. And we'll get into some of the more interesting stuff with epigenetics later. Uh, they contribute to all functions within a plant, the genes do, and DNA mutations and farmers' personal selections drove evolution of domesticated plants. And these different alleles of a gene can have different effects on the life and structure of a plant. And finally, selecting plants with the best set of beneficial alleles is what we call breeding. So all of that just to get into what breeding is about. But uh, that is the end of this section. And I think we could take about five minutes just in case anyone has a question. So um, I'll leave it up to you. All right. So if anybody has any questions, then the best thing to do is to just raise your hand. Um, if you know how to do that electronically, or you can also write a little note in the chat and mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll see if I can open up the chat here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't be shy now. <laughs> <laughs> Not, so many, not that many people in the room, so feel free. Yeah, I'm dumping a lot of information, so please, yeah, ask questions if if you need to. Well, okay. You're a good I'll teacher. Talk. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll talk slowly, but I guess if we are good, we'll move on to the next section. Okay. All right, they're all just itching to get to breeding, that's why. There's one question uh, down here. Okay. Now. See. How many varieties are there of an allele, it says. Oh, well, that all depends. There could be two or there could be 10 or 20 or more um so so like i said like in rice like one species so the staple crop of the world pretty much is rice or actually just the number one staple crop um there's thousands and thousands of different varieties of rice and so there could be thousands and thousands of different alleles of a gene um, so it's uh it really depends on what you're working with because um, really it's just any variation of a gene. So a gene that dictates um, fruit color of a chili plant. Um, any small little mutation in the sequence of the gene, um, we'll call, then we'll call it a different allele of that. So hope that answers your question. Um, I see a second one. Defense mechanisms, importance of exudates to attract beneficial microorganisms. Yeah, so yeah, with that comment, um, absolutely. So, so the, uh, the process involved in, in staving off certain like infectious organisms in the soil are actually the same process to produce things that bring in beneficial organisms. So it's required uh, for, for example, like in legumes, uh, the rhizobia bacteria that fix atmospheric nitrogen. Um, so in order to form those little nodules in the roots of a bean uh, or alfalfa, um, there needs to be communication. And the first thing that happens is the plant will start to exude sugars into the soil and in doing so will attract the rhizobia to show up 
and not any bacteria is going to be encased in a nodule. So there's communication there for the plant to make sure that this bacteria is the beneficial one that it wants. And once it communicates in that way, then it forms the nodule. So, so yes, the plants are giving out compounds even into the air, but also in the soil um, to attract these things, but also to repel other ones. Um, so it's a complicated relationship. Okay. And I guess I'll move on then. Great. So now we're getting into plant breeding methods. So now we know a little bit, of, a little bit about DNA. Um, there are alleles of certain genes, so there's good and bad alleles that we want to breed for. But how do we end up doing that? So you're part of a seed saving group, so I'm sure you don't really need this, but um, why are we seed saving and breeding? And reason is, is because agriculture is nature, but it's not the wild. So we can't just let, um, we just, we can't just let our plants run wild, right? Because in nature, alleles will prosper that best fit the needs of survival. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean a big tasty fruit or good timing of maturation so we can harvest it before it gets cold. Um, but in agriculture, alleles will prosper that best fit our needs. So that's why we are the force of nature. We're telling the plants which ones live, which ones die, which ones get to reproduce. And that's how it works. So uh, just a couple definitions. I'd like to say, uh, so in this seed saving, right, you are a steward of a plant population. So you have a particular variety that you're growing out on your farm and you collect seed from it. You might be making sure that it's not crossing with anything else. You might be taking out um, certain plants that don't look very good in your field before you start collecting seed. And actually, the minute you start doing that is when it becomes breeding. Uh, because when you're imposing control on the production of the offspring, so not everybody gets to reproduce, uh, you're now breeding those plants. So the importance of seed saving, non-farm breeding, we are moving our crops forward, right? Continuous evolution needs to happen for local environment adaptation, especially as we're seeing how certain climatic conditions are shifting. Um, we need to keep breeding for the best plants of our current environment. Um, also good for land race heirloom preservation in the seed saving aspect to be a steward for that. And also local adaptations. So what's better suited for your farm, how you farm, uh, what are the environmental conditions. Also, it gives you unique characteristics. So a lot of farmers here in New Mexico, I'm sure there too, um, when they're selling at the market, something that's unique is really important. Um, Self-reliance, so you can save your own seed, you don't have to purchase it all the time, and you get some new, tasty, interesting food out of it. So, uh, once again, you're part of a seed saving group, so I'm sure you're aware of this, uh, but this is important for breeding, so I'm going to mention it. Um, you need to make sure that whatever you're saving seed for is isolated uh, genetically, and so for instance, you wanna be aware of the species that you're growing. Um, in this example here, so this box here on the right. So if you're growing a cucurbit like a squash, you wanna make sure that you're not growing two members of the same species next to each other if you're saving seed from them because cucurbits, they love to outcross. They are insect pollinated. So bees go to every single flower they see. Um, and so if you are planting like a zucchini, that's in the group of cucurbita pepo. So if you plant a pepo also in the same field, the seed you get is going to be a mixture of the two. So if you're trying to 
keep it as a zucchini, then you got to make sure you're not planting anything else like that around you. Um, similar for these other different species of cucurbit. So if you do plant like a, a pumpkin and a zucchini in the same field, you're probably going to be okay because they don't really like to cross pollinate because they're different species. Another important thing is to be aware of the weeds. So what you can do, like if you're saving brassicas, for instance, like a broccoli or a cauliflower, be aware that you might have some weeds that are like a wild mustard. And those are also brassica. And they could very well cross with the brassica that you're planting. So maybe time it right. Uh, make sure you're selecting a certain window where the wild brassicas are not flowering, but your crop is. Um, so it's important to know how your crop is pollinated. Could be through the wind, like corn. Uh, their pollen is coming from the tassels at the top of the plant, just blowing in the wind. Um, insect, animal, so is it pollinated by insect or does it like to just self-pollinate, uh, like the lettuces uh, and beans, they like to self-pollinate as well. So knowing that is really important too. Because if they are self-pollinating, then you can grow them near each other in the same field, not worry about any crossing. And if you have to, so if you're growing, you know, two different pepo cucurbit in one field, but you want to save seed from it, then you can isolate it. Uh, you could do physical barriers. For example, here in this picture, these are single plant seed cages that we use for our chili breeding program. Um, what we do is we pick off all the flowers and developing fruit on the plant. Once we like that plant, and we want to save seed from it. We pick off all the flowers and the fruit, cover it, and then everything else that's developed within that cage is selfed fruit, so only the genetics from that plant. What you can also do is isolate by distance, um, like for wind pollinated, so corn. Um, you're going to need to isolate varieties of corn by like three miles. Um, but for things that are more insect pollinated, it's more like a mile or so. Um, and timing, like I said before, uh, you, could, you could just plant them at different times so they're not flowering at the same time. Okay. Now the next thing, the next uh, topic is a little more abstract, but it is genetic maintenance. So when we talk about genetic maintenance, we're, me we're mean that inbreeding depression is something that can happen if your population of the plants that you're saving seed from is too small. Um, if it's too small, what happens is that uh, you don't have allelic diversity, right? So when I mean allelic diversity, it means your population of plants doesn't have a lot of different types of genes. Um, so if you, if you have a small population, then the frequency of a bad allele, so like a non-functional gene, is going to show itself in a lot of the members of the population because there's not enough diversity in there to keep those bad alleles from becoming dominant. And the reason they do is because they become homozygous. Um, and I won't get into that concept too much. But the important thing is, is that depending on the plant you're saving seed for, you need to keep a certain population in order to keep this inbreeding depression from happening. So, uh, so over here on the right, this is like corn. If it was selfed over the years, you would see this decline in productivity, health, and yield. Um, and the reason is, is because these bad alleles are going to show themselves if it continues to be selfed. Um, here's another mathematical example. So what happens if there's like two different types of a gene, so two different alleles, at the first generation that you self that plant, there's going to be 50% of it where there's nice variation in the genes. But then it gets cut in half when you self it again, it's cut in half again when you self it again. So what you're seeing is this decline in diversity in your population. Um, eventually, 
it's completely inbred. And if you're not careful, it's going to be a very bad looking plant. Um, so keep your populations large. Now, you might be asking, well, how large am I supposed to keep this population? And there are references for that. So take note of this. Um, this is from the Organic Seed Alliance uh, here in Oregon in the US. And they have this seed saving guide. It's really nice. Uh, the most beneficial thing I've gotten from it was this table they have at the end uh, where it gives you the crop scientific name. So you can tell if it's in the same species as something else, how it's pollinated, um, the other important one is isolation distance. So you can see that if it's insect pollinated, uh, 1600 feet, uh, divide that by three and you got meters. Um, and if it's selfed, <clears throat> if it likes to self pollinate, then it's only 10 feet. And that's actually an important thing. Um, so when I talk about inbreeding depression, like back here, this is for plants that like to outcross. So like uh, squash and corn, but a lettuce that likes to self, it's able to handle being homozygous. Um, so it actually, it does just fine with a lot of inbreeding. So it depends on the plant too. And that's why you look over here, um, something that selfs, like a bean, you only need 10 to 20 plants to have a nice stable population. Whereas with corn that likes to outcross all the time because it's wind pollinated, you need a minimum of 200 individuals to have a stable population that doesn't result in inbreeding depression. So important when you're breeding that you're not just saving in seed from individual plants over and over and over again because what you'll end up with are some problems. Okay, so now we'll get into basic breeding. Um, so essentially what breeding is, like we talked about a little before, is that it's towards reducing the frequency of unwanted traits. So you're going towards something that you desire, right? And so you're either picking best plants or removing the worst ones. Now this, uh, process of removing the worst plants, it's known as roguing. And uh, so for example, you know, you'll have a source population. This can be a lot of different things. And I'll talk about each one of these types uh, as we go along. Um, open pollinated variety, a hybrid, you could make a cross of two plants and that would be your starting population, could be some seed you found in a garage. You know, a lot of a lot of farmers here have found like chili seed, of like heirloom varieties of chili from northern New Mexico that were just in a barrel in their grandparents' garage. And and they they've called me up and said, okay, what do I do with this? And uh, yeah, so it's a it's a process of growing it out, seeing how they look, and and I've consulted them on how to how to start selecting for a trait that they want and sort of build the population back up. Um, so we'll start off with these two types of source populations that you can start with. First one is open pollinated, OP. I'm sure you're familiar with this, but this is a population of plants that uh, when a seed saver or a seed producer is making, the whole population is allowed to pollinate amongst themselves. Um, because that population or that variety is isolated from other um, varieties that could cross with it. So they're allowed to just pollinate within themselves. And what happens is there's genetic diversity sprinkled into it. So it's a stable variety, but they have a little bit of a diverse characteristic between each plant. So it's really great for breeding or seed saving, like if you want to purify the variety to a particular trait, or you just wanna select some really good ones out of the population and work with that, OP seed is really nice to do that. Um, hybrids are a different story. So I don't know how much you work with hybrids there, but hybrids are um, 
pretty widespread here in the US. And they're nice because they create a really consistent, uniform, and often very productive plant. And I'll show you a little graphic about what hybrids are. But this uh, hybrid vigor results is called heterosis, uh, where the best traits of each parent are shown in the hybrid. Um, and I will get into it now. So this is just a graphic of what's happening genetically in a hybrid. So the first generation, so a hybrid is the result of a cross. And the cross is between these two parents that are very different from each other. But each one of these parents is highly inbred. So what that means is they don't have allelic variation in their genomes. They have all of one type. And so these two parents, which is called the F0 generation, uh, are crossed in the offspring, so F1. Um, if you've seen seed packets of hybrids, usually they say F1. And that's what this is. It's the offspring of the cross between these two very different parents. What happens is that each one of these offspring are perfect 50-50 combinations of these parents. So each one looks the same because they have almost the same genetic makeup between them. And that's why I show this little blue and green equal distribution here. And they all look the same. Now, I'm sure you've been told, don't save seed from hybrids, it's a bad idea. The reason is, is because you're gonna get something totally different from what you saw in the F1 generation. The F2 generation is gonna be completely varied. And in breeding, we call that segregation. But uh, each one of these is different because once these F1 individuals produce gametes, produce uh, pollen and egg, uh, the genomes are starting to mix up. And when they mix up and then recombine, you end up with all these different variations of the genome. And it can be a really fun breeding project. So if you're doing hybrids, then yeah, plant the F2 and start selecting plants from that. Because there could be some really good gems um, that are productive and interesting, maybe a totally different color or what have you, or just really adapted to the environment. I mean, the chances happen. Um, and then you can take seed from that specific plant and go forward. So uh, making crosses, it's pretty uh, simple, but it's different for each plant. But I'm gonna give an example of chili. And what you do is you first choose your two parents, kind of similar to that hybrid situation where you get two parents and then you wanna cross them together. What you'll have to do is isolate the two different parts. So in chili, it's what they call a uh, perfect flower or a complete flower. Um, where it has both the stamen, so pollen production, and the pistil, the egg production in the same flower. So how you deal with that? Um, what you'll do is you'll pick which plant's gonna be the mother. And here in figure two, you'll look for a flower that's just about to open, and you'll pick off all of the petals around this flower bud. And what you'll end up with is an exposed pistil. So you'll also use tweezers to take out all of the little stamens that are immature inside this too. So you have an exposed pistil here and it's ready to take pollen. So you'll have your plant that is uh, gonna be the father and you'll just pluck that flower that has an open, open flower with pollen all over it and you'll just brush it against this exposed pistil. And in doing so, you've pollinated it, and then you can cover this up and wait. And the seed produced from this fruit, uh, from this flower, will be what you plant out, and that'll be the F2. Oh, sorry, that'll be the F1. And you'll save seed from that individual plant, and then 
start looking at things in the F2, because that's where the differences will show up, similar to this here. So you make your cross, you plant out your individuals from the fruit that develops from it, and then you'll save seed from them, and then you'll plant your F2s maybe out in the field, and that's where you'll see all of your differences. So that's making a cross, that's essentially generating genetic diversity uh, to start breeding. So back to the basic breeding based on your source population. So essentially your review. So if it's a hybrid or a cross, select from the F2 generation. So two generations down and you'll pick single plants and then you could either isolate them um, or just take the seed from them and go forward. And you'll sort of be selecting the genetics of the beneficial plant that you see. Uh, an OP variety, so you're already starting with a source population that's not as diverse as the F2 from across, but also diverse enough possibly to find some good plants in it. Um, so you'll either select single plants or rogue weaker plants and save seed from the rest of the population. And the next stage is to plant out your single plant selections in individual plots. So you'll look at those plots and see if they have any variation in them. Um, and you'll either select a single plant again, and I'll get into this in a second. Um, so that's the next stage, once you pick plants. Um, an important thing to mention is uh, how are you going to um, start breeding depending on if your crop is self-pollinating or cross-pollinating. So self-pollinating, um, so something like grains or lettuce or beans, you can grow plots of your single plant selections next to each other without a worry of mixing the genetics up um, because they're selfing. So they won't, as long as they're not physically touching each other, they're probably not gonna cross. Um, makes it really easy to manage the field. And generating diversity though is a little more difficult. You're gonna have to make crosses with those self-pollinating plants uh, to make anything new. Whereas if your plant likes to cross-pollinate like chili, uh, brassicas, squash, corn, uh, diversity is inherent in open pollinated fields. Um, so you will get a lot more diversity just from planting out a variety in cross-pollinating plants. Uh, but the issue is that isolating them genetically is a lot harder. So this picture over here is uh, was a very eventful year um, in our breeding program when we were growing out multiple different varieties and they couldn't cross with each other. So we had to cover them in these cloth seed cages. And uh, it's quite a bit of work. Um, so I don't know if, uh, if this would be happening in a farm scenario, but for us, you know, we had a lot of research funds and timing uh, to do this. But this is the sort of thing that happens when you're, when you're doing a large scale breeding project with something that likes to cross pollinate. You have to isolate them. Um, so moving on. So when you're selecting single plants that look good from your source population, um, you can either isolate them to get self seed, like an individual plant cage, or closing up the flower, uh, like this squash example. And then you'll get 100% of the genetics from that chosen plant, uh, which could be good if you're really looking for that trait that you see. But you can also do a little more of like a holistic approach where you just select, you just take seed from whatever fruits produced out in the field um, and you don't even attempt to isolate it. So then that would be OP, open pollinated. What will happen is the resultant seed that you have is about 50% of the genetics from the chosen plant you liked. Um, at least. And 
So then the other 50% will be from plants around it, which will either be okay, because maybe you want to preserve diversity in the population in that way, and that's fine. Um, what will happen though, is it'll just be a longer process to get to the traits you want. Because if you do this again, like let's say you have one plant that you really like and you let it produce OP seed, then you take that seed and you plant only that seed out next year. Uh, and then you make single plant selections again then it'll be 75% of the genetics you like, liked. And then the next generation will be a little more. So it's like a half, half as much again, half as much again. Um, so theoretically you are working towards what you saw in that first plant, but you're not getting there quite as fast. If you wanna speed up the process, you get self seed from that good plant you saw that first year. So um, now I'd like to get into different methods of breeding. So which type will work for your goals? Uh, there are a lot of different types of breeding and it can get very specific. And I just don't think it's really needed. <laughs> um, there's really just three different things um, to look at. So the first one, mass selection and the pedigree selection. And the third one, more technical is back crossing, but I'll get into all those here. So the first one, mass selection, it's essentially what I've been talking with you about uh, during this time, is that you'll start with a diverse population, um, your source population, and that could be OP seed or the result of a hybrid cross, the F2, and you'll take selections uh, or rogue the unwanted plants. And then, so you'll either collect seed from the whole population if you just took out plants you didn't like. Um, and then you plant them the next year. Each plot that you plant will be the seed from one individual plant. And then you'll look at all those plots and see um, how does so if one particular plot looks really good and uniform, then save seed from the whole plot. But if the plot still has a lot of variation and has some traits that you don't really like, then make another single plant selection from that plot and do it over again the next year. Sometimes or oftentimes it takes two rounds of single plant selections to get that special trait that you're looking for. Um, and also, if, uh, if you're doing a roguing method, then all you have to do is get rid of the plants that look bad or don't have the trait you want and so take seed from the rest of the whole population and then plant it out all again next year, rogue out the plants, take seed from the whole population. It's a slower process. Um, and that's more of like a, a mass selection approach. So for example, um, this is some chili we planted last year. It's a variety that we are very close to releasing, which means looks pretty uniform. Um, it produces well. So we planted it, the whole population in this one big field here, and it's surrounded by corn because it's kind of an extra barrier uh, to keep pollinators from finding it. But it's also physically distant about a mile from any other chili plots. So it's an isolated field of one population of this variety we're making. And once they started to mature a little more, we, uh, we went through and pulled out plants that didn't look good, so we were roguing. Um, if it looked like they were getting some kind of disease or a virus, then we pulled them out, threw them out of the field. Um, if their fruit wasn't shaped quite the right way that we were hoping for, we'd pull those out. And in doing so, what we're doing is uh, purifying this line. Uh, so it's a little more uniform and ready for release. So the next thing is pedigree selection. 
And pedigree selection is essentially um, the, uh, the result of a cross. So you'll start with your cross in year one. And then in the F1, you'll just save seed from it. And uh, the F2, you'll start working on it. And in the F2 here, you'll make your single plant selections and grow them out in individual plots and do like I just said before. But the important thing with pedigree selection is that you're usually making a lot of different crosses because you wanna produce a lot of variation and it's usually like, you know, one in 200 plants is gonna be some kind of new trait that you like. And so you'll make a lot of different crosses and you're gonna record the parents for each one. Um, you're gonna assign accession numbers for these individual plant selections you make, uh, which I'll show you in a little bit how to uh, keep records of this stuff. Um, but you'll pick single plants from the F2 and then do whole plots of each plant selection and you repeat it. And you document each plant's parents uh, generation after generation because if you go down a bad road because sometimes you make a selection, you think it's really good and then the plot looks really bad, but you don't wanna give up on that line, you'll go back to your records and find the seed from the single plant selection that was the parent and you'll start over with that. Uh, so that's why it's important um, for traceability. So here it is. So making a database, you can either, um, you can use database software, you could use basic spreadsheet software, uh, but the important thing about it is that you're monitoring um, what it is, what its parents were, where it's planted. So for a participatory plant breeding program, this is important, especially because um, one variety or one line might be planted in multiple places. And if it is, it's gonna get a different accession number. So this is where databases come in handy is because first we have um, an accession for the year. So that's what this W21 is here. Um, and then we have a number and that number is essentially just the order of it put into the database. So it's easily accessible, it has its own identifier. And that identifier is what's on the stake in the field. And so you bring this list with you into the field and you see which is which. But also what's really nice is when you use these number identifiers in the field, it sort of emotionally separates you <laughs> from, from what variety it is, like when you're just looking at it in the field. And, and that's good because I've learned from breeding, you can get attached to certain things that you're breeding. Um, even though they might not be the best and you really should drop it and move on to the next stage and make some new selections. But if you're really stuck on it and you see that label in the field that is the one you love, you're gonna be partial to it and you don't wanna do that. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of nice to separate yourself a little bit by just assigning numbers. Um, but this is important to keep this database. One person should control the list uh, for the plant breeding program uh, because as you add these on, you don't wanna share it between people because they'll change it around. Um, so really either standardize the system or only one person is putting it together. Okay, and this a uh, little more technical piece. I don't know, um, you might be getting into this, but back crossing is when you have a variety that's really good already, but there's like a root disease that's coming through um, that all of a sudden it's susceptible to, but all the other traits are great. You know, it's, it's producing well, it matures on time. Um, so what you'll do is you might cross it with a variety that doesn't really have very good traits, but it's resistant to the disease. So you'll cross them together. So you can hopefully get that disease resistance trait into your good variety. But what's gonna happen a generation later after that cross is your good variety is gonna be mixed up 
with that wild version of the variety or whatever it is, and it won't be the great fruit that it used to be. So what you have to do is start back crossing. And what back crossing is, is then crossing it again with your original nice looking parent or your preferred variety. And what that does is it slowly puts the good genetics of what that variety was back into the one that you crossed. And you'll keep selecting plants year after year. So you, you'll keep the resistance trait in there, but at the same time, you're building back that good looking trait that you want in the variety. So it's a generation after generation, you'll keep back crossing till slowly you get back to the original great looking parent, but it also has the resistance trait. So it's, a, it's something to do if you make a cross and then you wanna get it back to a certain trait, you might cross it again with that one um, and sort of push it along. So you could do this, um, if you wanna do it formally and technically correctly, you're gonna do multiple generations of back crossing. Um, or you could just do one or two and see if it helps. Uh, so it's all up to you. Okay, so in summary, breeding is the simple act of controlling which plants get to reproduce. Uh, it depends on the source population and your breeding methods will be different depending on that. So you do mass selection, um, you're working on F2s of hybrids or OP varieties with variation. Pedigree selection is when you yourself make a cross and then you start working with it. Um, that's pedigree selection. You can follow it up with back crossing if you need to bring back to a certain trait, um, but it's a multi-year process. Uh, traditional breeding programs take about 10 years to develop a variety. That's average. So um, anyway, so how does this sort of breeding process become a group effort? And that's when we get to participatory plant breeding. And now before we break again, I just wanted to give this final important seed issue uh, about patents. So I don't know how it is in Norway, but for us here in the US, we have a Plant Variety Protection Act uh, started in 1970 where people can develop a variety and if it's unique enough, they can patent it. And what that means is any other individual who tries to sell it or market or offer it, deliver it, consigning, exchange, exposing the variety for sale, um, use it for breeding, that's all illegal. Um, if it's under this protection act, if they patented the seed. Um, so it's, it's something that we're trying to fight against um, some organizations, but uh, it's hard because these larger seed companies are patenting a lot of the things they produce and it's making it harder and harder uh, to be your own plant breeder. So we just tell everybody, you know, look for the, the OP varieties or the hybrids that you are taking and you wanna start breeding with, make sure it doesn't have this plant variety protected label. Um, so I don't know if there's something like that there, but if there is, definitely be aware of it. Yeah, definitely there is that. It's for all of Europe. All of Europe. I oh, think, okay. I think, I think it's I think it's all over the world, actually. But yeah, definitely we have that those regulations in Europe as well. All right, yeah. So be on the lookout for that then, because um, yeah, if you do start, especially as a as a public organization like yours, if you do a plant breeding project, it could very well come back to bite you. <laughs> so yeah, the other thing is that if you want to get it uh, registered as a new variety, that's also a complicated process and fairly expensive. It's like, I think it's something like 8,000 euros to register a variety in the EU. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that is, uh, that's the end of this section. So, you know, if anyone has any questions now, we could do that. Does anybody have any questions then just raise your hand or put them in the chat. I could start with a couple of simple questions just until other people add. 
I sure. was going to start with a question that's probably there's a super simple answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And that is how come selfing plants don't suffer from depression in general? Ah, you know, that is a, that's interesting. It's really hard to explain. It's, it's even hard for me to wrap my head around. So it's not a simple question. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, it's a, the reason is, is because, um, there is, it's, it's something about how, um, okay, here's, here's what I believe. Um, so the ones that are good, that are okay, um, with selfing, they, uh, they have a lot of inherent diversity within their genomes. Like, uh, so barley, for instance, it's, um, a huge genome and it's polyploid, which means there's always five or more different alleles of a single gene um, in it. Whereas other things like uh, corn, for instance, I, I don't think it has as many alleles in it. And so it might suffer because those bad alleles show up faster. Um, and to be honest, that's all I could say. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, a good explanation. That makes sense. They have more diversity yeah. within their genome, basically. Yeah, um, it's yeah. uh it's almost like they can. Yeah, they have their own microcosm of diversity that they can exist within. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that would be the best way to put it. Yeah, Thanks. because yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's another question here that says, "What about the chili example where you isolate the plant?" <laughs> I suppose the question then is what happens to mm. the genetic diversity if it's an outcrosser, but then you've isolated it. Right. So that's the thing is if, uh, so we do this, we don't do it often. Like when we're, when we do single plant selections, we're doing it once or twice. Um, like first year and then second year, we do it again. And then we sort of open it back up uh, to allow for diversity to come back in. So the problem is inbreeding depression will happen after like three or more generations of selfing. Um, so that's why, you know, these single plant selections are just trying to narrow down to a certain amount of traits, but then you open it back up again um, and you'll sort of allow it to be open pollinated and then mutations occur and new recombinations occur once you start harvesting seed from the whole population again. Um, so it's like, you'll take it from one plant and then that one plant will produce 200 plus individuals that you plant out in the field. And because you allow those to cross with each other, um, you're sort of creating diversity all over again. So as long as you're not selfing over and over again, um, you'll be okay. Um, let's see. And then there's a question here from Veronica. It says, is it the same with the Bramley apples, the polyploid thing? Oh, I don't know. Mm. I just have to say, I don't know. That's, very, <laughs> that's a very specific question. Uh, yeah, with I apples, question that, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say with apples, you know, a lot of them are, are clones um, and grafted onto certain rootstock. Uh, there's not a lot of um, inherent diversity in apples. So, and I don't know if Bramley apples are different, but but for the most part with fruit, it's uh, we've been working with the same clones for like 50 years. <laughs> so. Yeah, we have the same here. We have a whole grafting course for our fruit guild and we basically just use grafts as well. We don't get into sexual reproduction of, of apples. Yeah, um, it usually produces yeah, a lot of variation. So. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, one question I had also, because you said that about hybrids, you said that uh, hybrids are uh, crosses between two highly inbred varieties, but can't a hybrid also just be two open pollinated varieties or any two varieties that, uh, that are not inbred as well to make a hybrid? Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's really just a terminology. Like uh, if generally when we talk about hybrids, we're talking about this the specific method of production of hybrid seed um, from seed companies. 
And that's, that's what I'm talking about in that situation, two inbred varieties. Because for those companies, uh, those two inbred varieties are highly proprietary. Uh, they keep them locked up uh, because that's, that's how they produce their magical hybrid. Um, but yeah, across from anything is a hybridization, right? So the idea with it being inbred is just that then you kind of have, have created genetic bottlenecks on both sides. So you know exactly which traits are on either side. And then it's more sort of mathematical when you cross them, I suppose. Right. You know exactly what the offspring is going to look like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Anybody else? Feel free to just uh, unmute yourself if you have a question as well and you want to ask it in person. And if you want me to help with the Norwegian, then also just let me know. Okay. Um, I guess there's a continuation of the, so I heard Bramley apples are triploid. Um, don't really understand much of this, but uh, is it same principle as explained with the barley? Um, it's possible, but like I said, with apples, um, it's not like the apples are selfing and then we're using that next year. Uh, it's clones. So it's straight the tissue from the previous tree. So they are never reproducing. Um, so it's uh, it's essentially a variety frozen in time. <laughs> so it's a little Carol different. Carolina also asked a question there. He says, oh, so yeah. if you could produce a F1 in first self-pollinating two parents and then next season mix them, question. Okay, so you produce an F1 in first self-pollinating two parents and then next season mix them. Um, I'm a little confused by the wording, but I think what you mean is you would, um, uh, I'm, no, I'm a little confused, sorry. Car Carolina, <laughs> can't, can't you just unmute yourself and then ask the question? Oh, she says, don't worry, okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess, but it would be like self-pollinating two parents and then next season mix them. Uh, I have one maybe that I could ask yeah. that sort of ends this uh, section if nobody else has any more questions. And it's sort of a, a step back, big picture question. Um, mm -hmm. Something that I'm interested in uh, when it comes to sort of where we're going as, uh, as a species, our own species and our relationship with all of our cultivars. Thinking sort of that we only really started to work on the genetic level in terms of understanding the genetic level, let's say 100 years ago, Mendel, since Mendel sort of, before that we really didn't know what we were doing. We did thousands of years of selection, but it was really just intuitive sort of selection, I suppose, most of it. Right. Um, but the question that I have is sort of that now that we're kind of moving evolution on fast forward in a way, with all the knowledge that we have, and we're able to do stuff that we're sort of pushing our cultivars uh, fast forward in a way. Um, you're saying, for instance, that a traditional method takes 10 years for a variety to evolve, and that's extremely fast, you know, in evolutionary time, and even in, in cultivar mm -hmm. time. Um, but then there's, you know, the question really is, what do you think about the speed in which we're moving in general with our cultivars, uh, considering now that, you know, you could even push it faster if you wanted to, if we got past traditional methods and into GMOs and all that. I don't want to go down to the GMO right. rabbit hole, but just sort of in general, what's, what's your opinion about how fast we're moving? Uh, you know, um, I think I think the speed of it could, uh, could cause some problems. Um, the one thing that comes into mind is bottlenecking, uh, because, because as we go so quick, uh, we do we do spread the, the single seed that we create to a bunch of different areas. And, and in doing so, we lose some of the diversity that develops slowly over time in each niche environment. Um, so, right, I don't think we're not, we are generating diversity in terms of recombinations, um, but we're not generating diversity in terms of evolution. So, so you're right, this, this speed that we're doing, it's almost experimenting with the tools we have rather than um, over you know, many, many generations, it's the creation of new tools, um, new traits out of, 
evolution and selection over time in one area. So, so in that sense, it's, um, yeah, I guess that's all I had to say about it. I wouldn't know if it's good or bad yet. <laughs> I'm mostly thinking about sort of the fact that we now are creating all these bottlenecks with global warming as well, and that we need to start thinking about adaptation to more important things than just human desire, what we like, human traits. But, yeah. you know, adapting these cultivars to become more robust to these changes and not just one trait, like not just one thing like drought tolerance, but, you know, mm -hmm. huge variations in, in climactic uh, conditions. Right. I, I personally wonder how we can do that. Like, how can we adapt these plants? I'm quite interested in that in Norway because we have a very extreme uh, environment. So that's sort of a question I have. Of how should I be adapting these plants to local, you know, the conditions that we will be seeing? And I don't really well, know that's the a, there's a, I mean, there's a concept of, um, I mean, for a lot of plant breeding um, projects, like at universities, they always try to, be breeding in different areas at the same time so like one extreme and another extreme so they can sort of breed it to be broadly applicable to different areas um so that's one way you can do it is sort of plant it here one year plant it somewhere drastically different the next year um and so that can that can breed resiliency in itself um, yeah, and I guess uh, participatory plant breeding is also part of that, which we'll exactly. Get <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Right. Um, so there are a couple more questions here. Um, one is, do pesticides and herbicides affect the seed? And I'm going to leave that for you to decide after this next section. <laughs> and next is, when it comes to roguing, do you have to remove the undesired plants before they grow fruit? And that's a really good point. Um, so they don't pollinate with desired individuals. Um, yes, ideally you would do that. But there are some times, like in our instance, um, we want to see what the chili fruit looks like. And at that point, it's already pollinated. Um, and so we will still rogue them because it does take the seed that contains most of their own genetics away from the population. So it's, a, it's still helpful to rogue even after they've pollinated because it removes it from your seed bank um but yes if you're looking for a trait that comes out sooner than when they start flowering then that's more ideal because then you could just take their genetics out of the equation completely um so yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh i guess that'd be it i guess we could continue on to the next section. Um, I guess I'm a, I'm a little late on time, so we'll see see how quickly we can go through this one. <laughs> That's totally fine. We've put it up for you know three hours, so you're, you're fine. Okay, great. Um, well, actually, uh, I think I might, how about a couple minute break? <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta take a quick bathroom break. I don't know about anyone else. <laughs> Five minute break. That's good. Five minutes. Okay. Cue the elevator music. There we go. <laughs> all right. See you all in a little bit. Great. There we go. Hvis det er noen som har lyst til å spørre noen norske spørsmål nå, som ikke har hatt lyst til å spørre tidligere, så er det bare å skru av mikrofonen og spørre. Så skal jeg prøve å tolke det over til Bradley etterpå. Jeg spurte egentlig det om det jeg hadde tenkt å spørre om, Andrew. Ja. I forhold til det med 
se om man får genetisk eh, trötthet eller depression i eh, hvis man eh, tar utgångspunkt i en plante. Var det det du frågade? Ja, alltså det som är er, mm. Ja, och så och så eh, jobbar vidare med den planta. Och där allt ja. är Ja, det man kan väl inte då en plant och utgångspunkt för för eh vidare dyrkning. Nej, alltså det han ja, är er det grejt om jag to- om jag översätter det till engelsk och så svarar på engelsk för det Ja, jag bara jag blir lite språkförvirrad själv det. <laughs> Nej, men det er, det kan vara flera här som inte kan norsk ja. därför. So I'm just going to translate that to English. The question is uh, in genetic, as it has to do with genetic depression again. And the question is, if you use just the genetic material from one plant. Uh, hi, Bradley. I am just, hey. while you were gone, there came a Norwegian question. So I'm just translating that question now. And so it's good that you're back to ask uh, that question. The question is, um, if you um, if you only use one plant um, to select from, uh, um would i mean the question is actually can you do that you can you just work from one plant i mean you kind of answered it earlier that you can do it in one generation right if you select you know single plants with specific traits you just the problem is it's the, it have to you think about it in terms of genetic bottlenecks you're creating a genetic bottleneck when you're only selecting from one plant and if you do a bottleneck on a bottleneck on a bottleneck you'll get in trouble but if you bottleneck once and then open it up again then it's not going to be a problem right Right. Yeah, that's essentially it. Because, mm-hmm. like, for instance, in uh, in cabbage, we do a, we are we're in a cabbage nation. There's a lot of a lot of cabbage eaters here, and there's a there. It's an outcrossing plant, so you, if you only suck from a few plants, you're very likely to get genetic depression fairly quickly. But what they mm-hmm. would do in in like Scotland and Shetland Islands, for instance, if a farm only had a few plants that they were able to save seeds from, then they would mix those seeds with other farms who had the same problem, like several small holdings who only had a few plants. They would then mix the seeds from those and that way they would avoid genetic depression. So that's one trick that's used. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Can I just ask because um, uh, Agneta Magnusson, she's, she's describing this in an interview with an old lady um that she has got seed from a from a plant a cabbage plant and she says that uh, well i just i just uh, uh, save the best plant each year and i save the seeds from that plant and then she so uh, as i understand uh, understood it it was just one plant one year that she saved the seeds from and for generations and i i find it quite strange that she could do that and 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 like year after year and come up with good plants still. Uh, so that's that's a good point. Um, the reason why it's worked for her is because when you take seed from that single plant, you're not taking, it's not only the genetics of that one plant. Because cabbage likes to outcross so much, um, you're actually probably getting 50% of the genetics from the surrounding plants. So you're actually, each year, yes, she's only taking a select amount of plants to save seed from, but they've they've had genetics donated to them from the whole population each year. Yeah. So it's it's like there's still a there's still enough variation in there. I would say maybe over a long period of time, without any new genetics coming in, it might get to a problem. But because it's open pollinated seed, um, it's not as bad. So actually, what's saving her is that she's not um, um, uh, separating the cabbage right. from from others. So right. Yeah. So if she if she started bagging them, yeah, she might end up with a problem. Yeah. The the mm-hmm. bottleneck is with when they flower, not when they're seeds. So as long as you have multiple flowering plants, and then you only save mm-hmm. seeds from one, you're still getting the genetic from the whole population. But yeah, I guess. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's actually it's a good way to do it if you um. You know you're worried about it, and you're breeding on your own farm. Just don't isolate them, and it'll be a longer, gradual process. But you'll keep enough diversity in there. <laughs> Hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Mm. That's why you have a lot of projects going at once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, well, I, I guess we can get started. Oh, sorry. No, go say? for it. No, it's good. Okay. All right. Okay. So the next section, um, this is epigenetics. So if you've heard about it, great. If you haven't, that's fine. I'm going to hopefully explain it in enough detail. Uh, so this is sort of the fun section because it's the new theoretical stuff uh, that's coming out of new studies in genetics that really makes seed saving important. So here we go. Uh, to introduce it, um, just to show the basic concept that the genome is influenced by the environment. Uh, it is limited by local conditions. So for example, in this picture, uh, this, is, this is coming from a book published in 1996. So this is a, I mean, this concept is really what brings you towards epigenetics. But these are leaf prints of a dandelion and they are coming from different environments. So up here in the top left corner, this is in this, this guy's yard um, or sidewalk cracks. Um, or cracks in other places, or dandelions found growing in the forest. So you see this drastic difference in phenotype, in the look of the plant, the physical appearance. And this is simply due to the environment. So obviously in the forest, it must have been a little more lush and nutrient dense and good conditions for it to grow, so it grew so big. Whereas in the cracks of a sidewalk, it could only do so much. So this is essentially saying that, yes, you might have good genetics, but it definitely depends on the environment you grow it in, right? You have to provide manure in the field <laughs> to have anything actually grow well. That's the concept. But uh, the interesting thing too is that genetic clones exhibit this high variation across environments. So even if it has the exact same genome, this dandelion either grown in lowland areas compared to alpine areas look drastically different. So in this little experiment that was done, um, he actually cut the dandelion in half, planted it in the lowland, planted it in the alpine area, and that's what resulted. So the genome is restricted by the environment that it's given in. And also here, the scabiosa or scabious, um, same situation where genetic clones look totally different in these different areas. So why is this? Um, I mean, the genome can only do so much with the resources that are there, right? So if the environment gives abundance, the plant receives it. Otherwise, plants live within their limits. So due to this fact, the plant is adaptable within its own body, right? So it adapts. If you go back here, even though they're much smaller, it still produces a flower and produces seed. So it managed its resources to still be able to reproduce. Um, but they're genetic clones. So there was no mutations to change the way this plant looks. It's a change in its genome in a physical sense without mutation. And that's what epigenetics is. So here's a good example. Um, so epigenetics, the scientific definition is a change in gene activity, plant phenotype that does not involve a change in DNA sequence. All right, so it's steering away from the fact that DNA dictates everything. Uh, one important example is defense priming. So if you've heard of this before, um, it is priming a plant so it's able to stave off infection from a disease better. And how this happens, it could be an environmental stimulus, um, the presence of insects, uh, the presence of pathogens, um, a drought comes through, it'll react to that and then be primed for the stress to come through again. Uh, so this naive plant, if it is exposed to a priming stress, it's almost like a vaccination. Um, it's, a, it's a small amount of the stress and then it will prime the whole plant because it'll signal throughout the whole plant that that happened uh, through spreading hormones throughout the tissues. 
and it's primed. And so what'll happen is compared to a naive plant without its priming stress, it will react slower, um, it will react faster if it's primed. Um, it'll have a stronger reaction if it's primed. It'll be more sensitized to smaller amounts of this environmental stress than the naive plant. So the genome is primed to react to it in a better way. But how does that happen without mutations? And that's where the physical changes come in. So uh, in the DNA scale, this is how priming events happen. So genes are turned off or turned on by this tight coiling or uncoiling of the DNA. Uh, the coiling of the DNA, like in this picture here, they're wrapped like spools around thread. Sorry, thread around spools. Um, it's called methylation. And methylation makes genes inaccessible, so it can't produce proteins anymore. So like in this DNA strand, this little red highlighted piece would be a gene, but it's wrapped up. So the proteins can't come in to start making what this gene produces. Um, so it's turned off. It's a physical coiling. But if an environmental stimulus comes in that needs the activity of that gene, they will uncoil and then be able to express themselves and produce the protein. And the most interesting thing about this is this coiling or uncoiling that happens can last for hours, like in priming uh, for a stimulus, or it can last even generations, which is the most interesting piece of this. Um, so we'll get into that. Um, in this case, showing inheritance of epigenetic modification was with lavender. Uh, they were harvested from the field and then planted in the greenhouse. Uh, seeds were planted and labeled by the parent of origin so they knew where the parents were coming from. <clears throat> and overall genome methylation, right? So the coiling of the DNA in certain places um, of greenhouse grown offspring were significantly related to their parent. So the seed coming from the field um, planted in the greenhouse in our traditional ways of thinking, um, they would be a totally different plant with just the same DNA, and that's what makes them the way they are. Uh, but what we're seeing is that these structural changes to what the DNA looks like, like some things are uncoiled and they stay uncoiled to the next generation. So whatever stress happened to the parent is actually passed on to the offspring. And we're seeing that because we see the same methylation patterns um, from parent to offspring, and it's correlated between them. Here's another cool example where uh, two caterpillars that are pests of a Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a wild mustard. Um, so this is the white cabbage moth and diamondback moth. So I'm sure you're familiar with this white cabbage moth. I'm sure you have it there too. I feel like it must be everywhere. <laughs> but uh, we have it pretty bad here. Um, so it just, it just cleans off all the leaves from any brassica you're planting. Um, but what you see is that uh, seeds from a Arabidopsis whose parents were fed upon by a caterpillar were able to deter the pest more effectively. All right, so here, so in A, this is the white cabbage moth, all right, feeding on control, which is just a wild mustard um, whose parents were just grown in the greenhouse with nothing special. And here, um, they were fed upon uh, by when, the, so they were, uh, their parents were fed upon by the insect. So what that means is that the parents felt this stress. And in reacting to the stress, they had epigenetic changes. And those were passed on to the next generation. And that next generation was more resistant because what you see is the mass compared to the control is a lot less of this pest. So the pest was less effective um, against those that were primed by their parents. 
And I'm sorry if you're hearing a cat. <laughs> um, so exposure to the environment allows for epigenetic learning. So this is really important for seed saving because what you're seeing is in one generation, you can have an adaptation to the stresses of your environment. So it's not just creating mutations and genetic variation. It's about making sure that you're breeding within the environment that you want it to adapt to. So winter cold memory is another one. Um, so vernalization, I'm sure you've heard of, is just a, a plant will need a cold period uh, before it can initiate flowering. And this is happening from a gene. And after a long cold period, that gene is methylated, silenced. Um, it's triggered to be silenced by all that cold. And, and then because of that silencing, when it warms up, it starts to flower. And there's been studies showing that the epigenetic modifications are inherited. Um, there are previous studies that say no. And so you might just say, well, six years later, they found out yes. And the truth is, is that they were looking at different genes. So if you look at different genes, you'll see some epigenetic inheritance is, is, uh, is inherited to the next generation. Some of them are not. So some things you want to reset um, because you don't want um, a seed to just come out of the ground and want to flower, right? So you want this kind of thing to be reset. So it has to sense that cold before it flowers. But the epigenetic changes that are inherited are the ones that might be a longer cold period before it starts flowering, rather than a short cold period. That kind of memory can stick around. And that's important because if the winters start to get longer and the plant doesn't adapt to that, it's gonna flower while it's still cold or a cold snap comes through and kills everything. So this is an example of, we are growing asparagus um, here in our field. And we decided to let it overwinter to see what happens. And uh, oh, I don't have the picture, but some of them decided to try and flower about a month ago as it started to warm up here. But then we got that winter storm event that happened across the country a couple weeks ago and it froze again. And all of those plants that tried to flower are now dead. <laughs> and the ones that decided not to flower yet are still alive. So in that moment, we just had a selection for a later flowering and a longer vernalization period. So there you go. So plants have intergenerational memory. Um, all of these different types of stresses can be inherited to the next generation to be more resilient to whatever stress it is. Heat stress, UV, insect damage, um, nutrients in the soil, you know, it can become more primed to deal with high salt in the soil or low nutrients. And so this actually um, brings to the question of, well, what about each different branch of the plant, right? They're all doing their own thing, right? They're all on the same plant, but these different branches are seeing different scenarios, right? Branches lower to the ground might be dealing with uh, low light, uh, whereas ones up top might be facing an insect stress on one branch, uh, whereas uh, a light stress on the other, um, anything like that, but each branch is facing different environments. And there is this theory now that epigenetic changes can be specific to each branch. And because you know how plants grow, their meristems um, grow into any cell type and each branch is doing its own production. So it's almost like a different family tree coming from each branch. Uh, so that's why I was thinking it's really important when you're saving seed to save seed from the, uh, the fruit that looks the best, right? Because it's endured the stresses and come out looking good. <laughs> so, 
So if you harvest those, then you're actually also harvesting those epigenetic modifications that are beneficial. And here's another great example. Um, it's a little different and it's about feeding preference of these butterfly. So what they did is um, the butterfly larva were fed on leaves of different odors. So the leaves odors were banana or mango. Um, and then the offspring of these matured butterflies ended up having a preference for the scent of the leaves that their parents were fed upon. So it's not like the parents showed their offspring where to go. It's just the larva fed on that leaf, grew up into a butterfly, and then the larva from that butterfly ended up liking the same type. So when you think about that for seed saving and breeding, it's really important to look at everything that's happening to your plant. If it's being fed on by an insect and it's harming it, you don't wanna save seed from that one because what's gonna happen is whatever the genetics of that plant and whatever compounds it's producing to attract that insect are gonna be inherited. And those insects, as they come out of the ground the next year to feed on it, are going to go straight to the ones that their parents fed on. So interesting stuff. And it's also, it's like an epigenetic modification on the insect side. So these footprints are everywhere. Um, they're signs of epigenetic activity and there's just a lot of orchestration. It can be during symbiosis. So you could say that you're selecting for epigenetic adaptation to the beneficial microorganisms in your soil as well. It's all important. So um, essentially, I like to say seed saving is an epigenetic act. And as soon as one generation, you can change things. Um, it can be from pest diseases, symbiotic organisms, wind, drought, temperature, seasonal shifts, nutrients. When do you plant your seeds in the moon phase? <laughs> <laughs> who knows um, but uh, yeah so this is actually hearkening back to um, at the beginning of this workshop when I talked about that pangenesis theory uh, that Darwin had that information from all the cells in your body were brought to your germ cells to pass on to the next generation and he was, that was essentially discredited once we learned about DNA, but now we're circling back to realizing that there may have been some truth to what he was saying there. So in summary, seed saving can show benefits as little as one generation. I'm gonna say it boldly. Um, and previous season's environment informs the plant's response to the next. That's why participatory plant for eating is so important because the origin of your seed matters so much. Um, and I would say that's all for this section. Yep. So maybe we could break real quick if there is some questions. Oh, artichoke. Yeah. Do you guys not know what artichoke is? <laughs> is it just something from here? No, we know what artichoke is. I'm not sure what that question is. Uh... Oh. Well, I don't have a picture really of it, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult one to show a visual of. It looks like a, a flower fruit almost, no, it, a flower vegetable. Can I yeah. say, sorry. Sure, go ahead. It was, sure. It, I thought the photograph, because he said it was, he was talking about um, asparagus, but the photograph was of artichoke. That was did I, I, did I say asparagus? Oops. You did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, that's my bad. Sorry, I meant to say artichoke. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so you're the one who doesn't know what an artichoke looks like. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. I get those. I get that mixed up in my head. I don't know if anyone else does, but I have that's to. Fair. I have to check myself every time if I'm saying asparagus or artichoke. I don't know. Yeah, fair enough. They're both a bit odd. Odd looking plants and odd named plants as well. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I have a few questions. If nobody else is going to start, then I can uh, jump in again, and then it gives people other people time to type in or ask questions. Um, I think this epigenetic topic is really interesting, uh, especially for us up here in the north, um, and also for anybody going towards plant participatory plant breeding. Uh, but one question I have, because I one book that I read le recently by by Paul Nurse, the biologist, is called "What Is Life." It's a really interesting book. And in there, he talks a little bit about epigenetics and he says that epigenetics doesn't, he's mostly talking about animals and plant and humans. And he says that it doesn't usually pass from one generation to the next in animals, uh, but it does so more frequently in plants. So I'm still trying to understand that, that difference that in plants, I mean, my question, my first question then is in plants, uh, how much of epigenetic memory I know you can't give me an absolute answer on this because it's, it's impossible, but just sort of, I'm trying to understand, can we assume that basically every individual plant has some form of epigenetic memory that crosses from one generation to the next? Or is it like every fifth plant, every hundredth plant? I mean, how common is this epigenetic, uh, you know, passing on of memory from one generation to the next in plants? Okay. Um, you know, I would say every plant does it. Um, because of all the papers I've read, they are all different types of plant. So we've seen it in monocots, we've seen it in dicots. And so I would say every plant has some kind of epigenetic memory. Um, to comment on that where uh, animals don't do it as much as plants. And that makes sense because for animals, right? We, uh, we form an organism and that's our form and we've sort of allocated reproduction to a certain segment of the organism. Whereas in plants, they are continuously uh, reproducing at each meristem at the tip of each branch. So, so their, their point of origin is always there at the tip. So it's always um, sensing whatever environmental stress is there and then it produces a flower and seed. So, mm -hmm. So it's the knowledge or like the, the reaction to the environment is right there as the seed is being produced. Whereas for animals, like I know there is some talk that there is a inherited stress and I think there is in some degree. Um, but, you know, if, if our hand is cut off, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily inform anything um, to like, gamete formation mm. um, but yeah that's the best idea i could come up with <laughs> i'm trying to then make stress i uh, just a follow-up question on that i'm trying to then make sense of what you were talking about when you're saying that if you select a uh, plant uh, seed from a plant that's been attacked by let's say um, a butterfly uh, mm -hmm. or a moth and then you shouldn't save uh, seeds from that plant because the next generation, probably the epigenetic memory in the moth will make it want to go back to eat that plant again. But yeah. wouldn't that be less yeah. the case in butterflies then because they're not, they're animals? Or how would that be? Would that be different on what they're feeding on specifically? Is like a feeding yeah. uh, preference more likely to be transferred in, in animals? That's, um, hmm. honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, because yeah, like uh, in animals, <clears throat> we do have hormones, we do signal our whole body when things are happening. Um, so, so there, I think there is some epigenetic inheritance of whatever might change, um, and it actually gets transferred uh, to the reproductive organs. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it that there is some epigenetic inheritance in I mean, maybe insects with a little more simple build and like mechanics and everything might uh, might make it easier for certain things to be inherited. But that's all I can say. Yeah, it's getting to the real theoretical stuff. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. There's one Norwegian question and then there's an English question as well. I guess you could take the English one first there and then I can try and translate the Norwegian one for you. Sure. Um, so a disease like club root be passed through to seed. 
Um, I don't know much about club root. Uh, is it a nematode or I'm not sure, but um, it really depends on the pathogen. There are certain pathogens where it's not seed borne and others that are. That's just something you have to research. Oh, fungus. Um, still, uh, from what, no, I'm not gonna say anything in particular, but I do, from what I understand, bacterial diseases can be a little more seed borne than fungal diseases. Um, but that is the best I could say. Um, it's very specific to the pathogen. Okay, uh, the other question that's in Norwegian, uh, I'll just translate it, it says, uh, what about with, for example, broccoli uh, uh, that has been eaten by um, uh, a moth? Uh, the next generation, will it be a little bit more uh, resistant? I'm guessing the question is, that is the broccoli then going to be more resistant in the next generation? Is the question. Um, right, yeah. So according to that study, um, which I'll go back to, and so this is where it's like, it's very, it's almost contradicting sometimes, right? Because <laughs> cause, uh, here we see that, yes, you're talking about broccoli. This was a study on wild mustard, but same family. Um, and, and it was that same uh, caterpillar, white cabbage moth, butterfly. Um, and yes, so the offspring were more resistant to the feeding of that insect. But at the same time, right, I gave you this example here where the insect, right, inherits a preference to what its parents fed upon it. So it's almost like both of these factors are coming into play, which contradict each other. But if you, uh, <laughs> um, but what you might say is that if a population of your plants are being attacked by this caterpillar and you save seed from the ones that are in the realm of this infestation, but doing well, right? Doing better than other ones that just got destroyed. And you save seed from the ones that do pretty well, but still are being fed upon. Then what, what you're probably selecting for is a plant that produces compounds that that insect doesn't like so much. And in doing so, um, yes, next generation, these will emerge and want to feed on the plants that were more susceptible, the ones that just got completely eaten. They have a taste preference for them. But what they come upon is a population of ones that didn't quite taste as good and so what you might see is another infestation next year, but not quite as bad because all the plants in your population are not preferred by that insect. It's kind of a all around and back again explanation, but <laughs> that's, uh, it makes sense. It's like uh, there's, that it? constant, uh, <laughs> there's a constant one-upmanship in nature, right? And so you're just trying to help the one-upmanship right. go in the right direction, basically. Right. Yeah. You're not you're not trying to destroy the competition. You're just trying to live with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I have another question here. That's uh, something that I very rarely admit to people that I've seen because it seems like it doesn't seem like it would make sense. So it's like, do I believe in some kind of hocus pocus when I say that I've seen this, but I've seen this in plants. And when you were talking about how different branches and plants seem to have their own Sort of epigenetic epigenetic memory that are separate from each other that they gave me the courage to admit that I've seen this and that is that sometimes it seems that some plants that are close to other plants somehow look more like those plants even though they're from a different species uh, huh. and so I've I've wondered if like do plants sometimes if they're being if they're being weeded out right and they and then they realize okay that plant's not being weeded out maybe maybe they somehow is there some sort of way that they can mimic i don't know that was the, that's the only explanation i had is that these plants seem to be mimicking each other somehow i've seen it over and over again and it's been ah it's it's very odd when it happens 
Ah, so that's why well, I never know. said it either. I never admitted admitted to saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you're not crazy. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, yeah. Okay. We have another comment in the chat. They've seen that too. So scientifically, the way I would put this is uh, plants, um, they do release hormones into the air. So they do communicate with each other. Um, they, uh, like when, every, when everything flowers at once, that's, that's a coordinated effort where they all just start sending out communication that, okay, it's time to do this. <laughs> so, so uh, and the same goes for, there are certain plant hormones that, you know, dictate, okay, elongate the stem or um, shut down the meristem, like don't grow anymore. Um, those kind of things, I'll go as far to say it, but could be transported through the air. And, mm -hmm. and so, so yeah, the plants that are not being weeded out and are still there are gonna receive or give out communication. And, and so it might cause them to look alike because they're getting the same signals from each other. It's really yeah. interesting. And it also tells you that this growing diversity thing, like having lots of plants growing together, that's quite a healthy thing then for an e ecology because they're sort of communicating with each other and they're like, yeah, we're all sensing this. Now is the time. But if it's just one variety, maybe they won't be as good at sensing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, there might be some different varieties that are more sensitive to, you know, whatever insect or whatever thing's coming through. Mm -hmm. Sure. Or they will all look the same, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, have you seen an example of a plant that insects avoided also tasting worse to humans? Ah. Well, that's actually, um, I haven't seen it myself, but I have heard that, yeah, when they become more resistant to insects, sometimes they taste worse too. <laughs> so, you can definitely um, say with brassicas that during the summertime when they're being attacked, they don't taste anywhere near as good as the wintertime. But that that could be other reasons that it's probably the sugars and the, you know, they produce more sugars when it's cold. But yeah. Yeah. But no, also too, they produce, uh, they produce these like bitter compounds that the insects don't like to eat. Um, and yeah, they're bitter to us. So, so that's totally right. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? I think that's good. Okay. All right. We're off to the last section. <laughs> A little bit beyond the time, but yeah, right. We have another hour. I know you're, you're staying up late there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's nine o'clock, but it's really interesting. So go for it. <laughs> great, great. I'm actually starting to feel tired. I think I'm like connecting with you, you know, <laughs> epigenetically. <laughs> okay, so lessons in participatory plant breeding. So we'll get into some of the logistics of this program. Uh, participatory plant breeding is a collaboration between farmers and researchers. Um, I say researchers, because that's me, um, but this could be, you know, replace the word with expert uh, or the leader, um, just the person who's knowledgeable in plant breeding who can help advise um, and coordinate the whole network. So the goal of this program is to develop varieties of crops utilizing farmers' fields and breeding for certain environmental conditions. So creating varieties that are specific to the land that you're on. Um, so it's a partnership, it could be called a network, a cooperative, what have you. Um, so why? Uh, these scenarios are probably similar for you too, but farmers have increasingly abdicated their role as seed producers. You know, most of the larger farmers, yeah, they purchase their seed, they don't save it very much. Um, and breeding and seed production has become centralized. Uh, it's either a seed company, and you know they only have certain amounts of fields um, in certain areas. Um, and thus, sometimes buying seed can become an economic burden for the farmer, especially for hybrids, 
uh, because the creation of hybrid seed is such an involved process, they're very expensive. Um, and so that cost is brought on to the farmer um, and they're trying to make some kind of profit as it is, so that's tough. Um, not all growing environments are considered in breeding and seed production because they can't, they can't be everywhere when they're producing seed to sell. I mean, here we have, a, especially for organic farms, um, the number one source of seed that most organic farmers get almost across the whole country is from Johnny's. Uh, and Johnny's, most of their breeding and seed production is up in the Northeast of the United States. So it's not adapted to the West. It's not adapted to the South, um, but that's where everyone gets their seed from. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's about decentralizing seed production. So they're adapted to the different areas. Um, and for universities and breeders, agriculture experiment stations are amply supplied. So if you're breeding for a stressful environment or the way you farm, you know, maybe you use sheep manure and an agriculture experiment station at a university is not usually going to do that. For the most part, they're probably just going to add um, anhydrous ammonium to the field to supply enough nitrogen. So uh, it's a different environment and it's also amply supplied. So unless you're specifically breeding for it, they usually don't breed for stressful conditions. Um, and uh, another thing is that universities and like the, the driver for producing varieties is usually coming from those that pay them to do so. And that's not usually small farmers of specialty crops. <laughs> so that's another reason. So we can choose otherwise, we can create these participatory plant breeding networks um, support small farmers, work together, and uh, yeah, because everyone has a different story. So this is a great resource. Take note of this one. Um, I used this to put together my grant proposal for this project. Um, so it's from the Organic Seed Alliance here in the U.S. They have a whole toolkit. Um, it's sort of uh, things to consider and even some worksheets to fill out if you want to, um, but just a helpful resource to get started. Um, some of this stuff I'm taking directly from it. So here we go. Uh, fundamentals of participatory plant breeding. I'm gonna go through a, a number of things and sort of give examples from what I'm doing at the same time. Um, so the first part is deciding on the format of what your program is going to look like. And this is about the relationship and the role of each member. So you're going to have your leaders or your experts or your researchers, and they're the ones that sort of made it happen, right? Um, but there's going to be a different level of role that that expert's going to have compared to the participant farmers. And so you look here at the bottom. Um, it goes from left to right in terms of farmer responsibility and role. So the first one can just be researcher manage. So all that happens is the farmer says, yes, I'll give you this land to grow out whatever you want to do. So it's just like a researcher having a breeding program on someone else's plots. Um, you move over more to consultative, and that's where the researcher is actually talking to the farmer about what the farmer wants before it before the researcher develops breeding goals and makes it happen. Um, and then collaborative. So this is more of the model that I'm working on is a collaborative model where farmers' goals are prioritized in project design. Um, it allows for the farmers to have specialized goals depending on where they are and what they want. Um, it makes it a little less of like an overarching goal of producing one variety, but more of producing multiple varieties depending on where the farmer is. Um, so collaborative model is nice. Um, and then finally, farmer led. So this is maybe later on when your participant farmers are a lot more um, accustomed to the breeding program and producing a variety. And then they, it's actually just a process of 
the participant farmers eventually become experts and then they eventually you know have enough autonomy to where they're just doing this and being part of the network um, so that's the eventual goal right and right so first you decide on this format next piece is uh, what are the breeding goals and expected products? So you got to put together what the expectations are. Um, first, are we developing a variety? Are we uh, are we working towards something that will be released to the public or sold? Um, so who's going to own it? Um, is it going to be the farmer whose main project it is? Uh, will it be the organization itself who owns it? Um, important questions to answer uh, before you go, get going forward. Um, and uh, what are farmers expecting to learn or gain? So do they just want the variety and they don't care how they get there? Or do they want to learn this um, and get some seed saving expertise and become autonomous? Um, and it's going to be different for each person. So getting those goals together What's everybody's expectations is really important. And then creating a realistic timeline and having regular meetings. So annual meetings are really good. You know, after everything's harvested and data is put together, and then you discuss what the next plan is. Um, but uh, here's an example of the timeline I put together uh, for our project. It's very overarching. This isn't specific for each farmer. I'll get into some of those examples later. But <clears throat> so in the first year, um, it is assessment and planning. So we were having farm meetings. So in this case, we already had everyone who wanted to join. And so I, with a colleague, was going out to each farm to visit with them um talk to them about their goals uh, what their farm looks like what they're capable of doing and we'll also help them in making initial selections like single plant selections if they need to things like that uh, if any preliminary variety trials were needed so one good thing for a plant breeding project is first to trial a lot of varieties that are already out there to kind of gauge um, which direction you should go, um, which variety should you start breeding with. Um, and so really you want to test what's out there first uh, before starting it. Because um, if you don't and you just start with one variety and you say you're going to breed heat tolerance, well that variety might not have any heat tolerance traits in it. And so you've already bottlenecked yourself out of the whole process. So, um, and then not uh, planning meetings, farm specific breeding strategies, plot designs, seed selections. Um, essentially the first year is, yeah, just assessing, assessing the farmer's needs and putting together some goals and also maybe some plant selections in the process too. Um, so for me, for example, this year, uh, we really made selections from whatever they were growing that year and and so I did nothing to talk with them about what their planting plans were this first year. It was just whatever they were growing, we started working with that. Um, and the reason being is, well, I'll get into details on some of them. Uh, but the next years are essentially cyclic. It's the same thing over and over again at this point. <laughs> um, it's uh, so you do spring and fall farm visits, you know, planting, and then whenever it's ready to harvest or when they're maturing or when it's selection time, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so when it's selection time, you might go out and visit and help out with that. Uh, and continuing on variety trials to sort of experiment with new things and creating uh, new germplasm sources for the farmers to try out. And community outreach is a big piece for our extension program. So uh, we make sure to report what's going on at our annual conference um and you know last year was tough so we didn't really go to farmers markets uh, but we will be advertising our program trying to get new members and um 
Yeah, so that's the timeline. <clears throat> so the next thing would be the target environments. And I just wanted to give a, a map of New Mexico and it's, uh, it's showing the USDA plant hardiness zones. So that's essentially based on the, the average minimum temperature. Uh, and New Mexico is pretty diverse. Uh, and I'm down here in the southern area of Las Cruces. Uh, so it is in the area that is the warmest part of the state. But we have participant farmers all up the Rio Grande um, from central New Mexico up to the northern colder parts. So all of these areas are very different. So breeding for those areas specifically is really important. Um, so you want to you want to situate what the target environments are where your farmers are and group them in that way. So if they wanna to work together to produce a variety, then you stick within your environmental group. Um, but at the same time, like I said before, if you wanna breed for resiliency and something that might be able to be distributed throughout the whole country of Norway, then you might wanna test these varieties at later stages. Um, in different environments to see how they work, just so you can advise um, farmers if they want to use the variety that, yes, it does work well where you are, or it doesn't. Um, and so organize your collaborations based on shared environments. And on this next slide, uh, so I wanted to give you a gist of what it looks like in the US. Here's New Mexico down here. Yes, we are pretty diverse for the Southwest. Um, and uh, actually what was really interesting, so I, I tried really hard to find a similar map of Norway. <laughs> and, um, and actually it looks like your variation in temperatures was really similar to ours. And I don't know if this is right, but it seems like there's a range of, um, the coldest areas are getting to negative 34 Celsius whereas the warmest areas are getting to minus six or seven Celsius. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it seems like your ranges are really similar to New Mexico, which is weird. <laughs> we have a huge range uh, because we have a Gulf Stream going all the way up the coast and then we have mountains. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a lot, a big, a big range. In that case, probably similar, but I would imagine that it's quite a bit warmer <laughs> in New Mexico. I would say so, and yeah. drier, much, much drier, yeah. <laughs> much drier, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if we're necessarily similar, but it looks like the diversity in temperature zones seems to be similar. So that's, uh, that's important, especially for participatory breeding. Um, so, all right. Uh, the next step on these fundamentals is yes, you have your farmer's goals or expectations of what they want, but what specifically are these traits that we're gonna look for? Um, and how do we measure them, right? Is it yield? Okay, we got weight. Um, is it fruit type? Is it the shape or the size? Um, if it is, then how do we standardize the measurement of that? Uh, compare it to something. Um, <laughs> Uh, taste. Uh, I'll get into a taste profile example of what we've done before, um, but also resistance and tolerance. So this is a little nuanced for resistance to diseases and things because each season is different. You know, a pest or a pathogen might break out one year and then be gone the next. Uh, so it's all about relative to the environment. Um, and so if there is an outbreak, then you take note of how severe it is, you know, how prevalent is it in the field? Um, how severe is it on each one of the plants? And if you take note of that, along with um, selecting for resistant ones, then you're moving towards a resistance, even if the next year there just is no outbreak at all, um, then, you know, you select for other things. <laughs> and that's why uh, here at the bottom, I say holistic selection because when you're not doing a strict scenario like in a university uh, or a college-based um, research trial, um, 
you're controlling the conditions and you're causing a stress or you are uh, infecting the field with a certain pathogen. I mean, you do things like that. So you're consistently selecting for certain traits, but when you're doing on-farm breeding, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't, you're not going to introduce a pathogen. You're not going to purposefully drought stress unless you know you can separate your trials from the crops where you're making your livelihood. You know, um, then sure, stress them out because that's just your breeding trial. Um, it has nothing to do with what you're going to sell. But essentially, you're doing holistic selection year after year. There are different stresses and you react to them and you breed based on them. And so there's a lot of traits you might wanna look at. Uh, also, I wanted to mention here how agricultural methods help to drive selection. So an interesting thing with chili and it's anything really, um, if you direct seed it into the field or you transplant it, uh, the roots look drastically different. Um, if you direct seed, for chili, for instance, they produce a nice deep taproot and they become more drought resistant. Um, whereas a transplanted chili, the root ball never produces a taproot because it's already failed at it and it's wrapped around in the cup of the soil cell. And so it produces just a root ball that's really shallow in the soil. So it can't handle drought quite as well. And so those kind of things of how you plant, how you water, what your rotations are, um, all those things come into play of what, <clears throat> what sort of things you're selecting for and what you expect to see in the field. Um, so there are certain simple things you can do to all of a sudden change how well your plant does without even breeding. Um, okay, so now I go to some examples. Um, so this was uh, this is in central New Mexico. There's a place, uh, a town by the river called Corrales. And this particular farmer, he, uh, he had his own variety of chili and he named it Corrales native. And what was going on with him is he saw some issues um, <laughs> Maybe there was some outcrossing with a different variety, but he noticed that the traits of his chili have started to show a lot of variation in his field. So what we needed to do was sort of start moving towards the trait that he wanted. And so what we did is we got out there in his field right when the green chili was ready. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but we love green chili down here, which is, uh, it's a pepper that's long and, and thick walled, like you see here in these pictures. And it's not really necessarily edible raw. What you do is you roast it. Um, so you, you roast it on a grill or a fire and the skin ends up peeling off and then you have this nice soft, um, delicious fruit uh, to eat there. And it has a very distinct taste. It's nice and spicy. It's great. Um, but uh, he noticed that the taste in his was getting a little more bland and the shape was a little off. So if you look at these, uh, what we did is we went through and we picked good looking fruit that looked like the type that he wanted. Um, but this one here, so number seven, this fruit was a little thicker. Um, this is not quite what he was looking for. His chili looks more like this one, number 14. Um, so what we did is we looked for chili that looked like this. We labeled them. So we put the little flags at each plant. And, and then we took all the fruit off and we took all the flowers off and we put them in bags. So we did that. Uh, single plant selection in his field. And so now this following year, this year he's going to plant each one of these um, in their own separate plots. So maybe like 10 feet of each one, or maybe more if he has the space. Um, 
but then we'll look at that and the multiple plants produced from each single plant and we'll move forward with that. We might do one more single plant selection or we'll start um, harvesting seed from the whole plot. And uh, so that's an example of, you know, looking for specific traits. Um, he even roasted each one of those separate chilies and tasted them, rated them based on taste, things like that. Um, so we knew what traits we were looking for and we're moving forward to help produce his specific Corrales native chili, which has sort of made him popular at the farmer's market in town because of his special type. So that's why we want to make sure that he has that. Uh, another thing, um, so what I'm saying about how something might outcross and lose its particular trait, uh, this is another um, similar scenario with a cucurbit, but what we call it is phenotype rescue. Um, so he wants this Melon Mexicano, which is a, it's a cucurbit and it produces a nice sweet melon uh, with a yellow flesh. And it seems like he said it has cross pollinated with a cantaloupe at some point. You know, cantaloupe is a little more orange flesh and definitely tastes different and looks different. So we're trying to rescue the phenotype of his old one by growing out the seed he has and selfing the ones that look most like the Melon Mexicano. Um, we may this year result to back crossing um, if we can find pure seed. Uh, the problem is, is this is an heirloom seed he's had with his family. And I don't think he has pure seed of what it used to be. So the best we can do is slowly try to breed it back to what it was. And so that's another project we're working on. Um, here's another one, uh, selecting for productive uh, late season summer squash. So one problem we have here in New Mexico is what is called the squash bug. And it lays eggs in debris, plant debris in the winter and <coughs> sorry, over winters and patches in the spring to find new squash plants to start laying eggs on and feeding on. And it can really destroy the health of the plant. So what we decided to do was grow this summer squash. Um, so what we're looking for, are, it's, there's a lot of variation in this. We actually got it from a farmer in New Mexico who was uh, very proud of his squash. And we grew it out and there was variation all over the place. And you know what, that's what he liked. <laughs> but uh, what we're doing is um, we picked the ones that were most productive, you know, looked interesting, um, but we planted them late in the summer. Or actually, not really late in the summer, more like the beginning of summer. But this was after the squash bug had hatched, you know, and searched for um, a squash plant to feed on. So we were hoping that we missed the life cycle of the squash bug. But the problem is, is that then you might not get as much fruit out of it because you planted it late. So we decided to just measure how much fruit it produces. And then the best yielding ones, the ones who matured really quick and produced a lot of fruit before it got cold, we move forward with those. And we selfed the best ones. So if you're not familiar with selfing squash, it's probably one of the most fun ones. Um, you, uh, so it has separate uh, male and female, so imperfect flowers. And you can tell by a the bulge at the base of the flower that's going to produce fruit is the female one, uh, whereas the male one is a little more thin stemmed at the base. Um, but what you do is the evening before, you look for flowers that are just about to open and you close them up. You just keep them cinched closed with some string. The next morning, you'll come out and you'll see that they really want to open because it's daytime. Um, but you'll take the males that have been closed and rub them on the female pistil on this other one and then reclose that female flower because they're insect pollinated. So they are, they're gonna get pollinated if they're not covered up. So you'll rub the males of that plant onto this female flower, cover it up. And then once that flower starts to die and fall off, you know it's been pollinated, it's done. And you'll mark um, that fruit, and then that'll be your self-seed. 
So this year we're going to plant uh, plots of each of those single plant selections that we selfed, and we're going to see which ones do best, you know, and continue to either self them for one more year or move forward with one particular line. Um, and so that's another project. Okay, so um, management considerations. So this is really important. Um, you have to know what sort of resources the farmer is able to give, uh, especially labor, uh, maintaining the fields, time, their land, and how they might be compensated. So for us, we're able to give our farmers uh, a stipend for participating because of the grant that we have. Um, so it helps, it helps a little bit with their labor cost and the fact that they've allocated portions of their land to this project. Um, also resources for the manager or the expert or whatever you call them. Um, so their time for instructing the participants, the field visits, being the liaison between everything. Um, also breeding and seed saving equipment if needed, like these cloth seed cages. Um, being the storage of the seed, also another one. Uh, but it seems like you have a, a seed library in place, so you kind of have infrastructure to make this happen already. Um, and hosting annual meetings and managing the data. And so I'll get into some of these things now. Uh, so the first thing that I like to do is an introductory questionnaire to whoever wants to start to participate. Um, Briefly, some of these sample questions would be describe the land management and farming operations. Um, we want to know how they do things so we can uh, really document how this seed has adapted to that type of farming. Um, do you currently save seed for crop production? That's a good one because to see if they have some knowledge in saving seed for their own crop is really important. Um, it helps gauge how much uh, introduction they'll need. And what are three main goals that you would hope to achieve? The reason why we ask for three main goals is because we won't be able to satisfy all of them. And also we could find other farmers that might have similar goals in mind and, and link them up. So plant traits you would like to improve as an example, pest or disease problems, environmental adaptations. So those are some of the examples of what you might want them to answer. And uh, data management. So data management, I would say, needs to be centralized. I gave you the example of that database for how you label your seed, um, giving it accession numbers. It's really good if just one person controls that. Um, also, deciding what traits will be measured. You want to standardize it. Um, so you might want to create a data collection worksheet of what it is they're actually going to measure at what point. Um, seed management needs to be centralized too. Um, at least keeping the seed records. Um, you know, sometimes, I mean, we have some participant farmers that really believe in the sovereignty of their own seed. So they don't want it to go public because they don't want a company to pick it up and run with it. So, um, Sometimes they just, they want to do their own seed saving operation on their own farm and that's fine. Uh, but it's something to figure out at the beginning. Um, and a question of community sharing that needs to be addressed. So, so figure that out and then, you know, whoever keeps the seed, well, make sure they're keeping it and recording it and documenting it correctly. So here's an example of a worksheet we did for taste of a uh, heat level of various cayenne um, and Indonesian peppers. And what we did is we gave them bags or if they were growing it, then they could just taste it as it is. But labeled with these exception, accessions, their names and various um, aspects of heat level. So there's a lot of different aspects of how capsaicin tastes, interestingly. Um, and we would give them descriptions of what each one is and how to answer it. 
and and then they would fill this out, send it back to us. And so, yes, we have a central place where we deal with all this data and enter it in. Um, so that's sometimes helpful because, you know, if, if the farmers or the participants have exactly what they need to do, then there's nothing misunderstood. <laughs> so it's helpful. And uh, this is actually the last example I want to give is a farmer collaboration example of a heat tolerant lettuce. Um, so I know there's been some questions about how, yes, daylight and season length is really tough for you up there. Um, so, so this is an example of us, which is kind of the opposite that we have a lot of heat in a long season. But for this, um, there is a farmer who wants a head lettuce that lasts into the summer. Um, and you know, it gets very hot, so it's hard to keep lettuce from bolting. Um, so what we wanted to do was select for a late bolting lettuce. Um, and so we had to ask some questions to address this goal. Uh, when to, are we gonna plant? Well, we wanna push the limits of the ideal window, right? Because we're breeding for a stress tolerance, we may as well just impose that stress. Uh, so we planted it late. Um, where to plant? Well, a hotter region. So we actually decided to do the variety trials down where I am in Las Cruces rather than his location in central New Mexico, which is a little cooler. Uh, what will be measured? Quality and bolting resistance. And I'll get into those details in a second. So what are the main steps? So we first in year one um, conducted variety trials at the NMSU campus garden, which is here in Las Cruces, so the hot part of the state. Uh, we looked at eight different varieties. If we had more space, we'd do more, honestly, the more the better. Um, but we did replicated plots. So randomizing three plots each of those varieties in an area. Um, I converted it to meters for you. <laughs> um, planted relatively late in the spring to encourage bolting in hot sunny conditions. So, you know, usually for lettuce, you really, you get them out there when it's still very cold. Uh, but what we did is we planted it very late where it's actually already warming up into summer. Uh, for us, that's late March. And, and so we plant them in late March um, to see, you know, which one bolts last. And we also measured the quality of these heads by yield and size, aesthetics, taste. And, and uh, the interesting thing part for measuring bolting here was uh, we took half of the plot harvested for yield, like 10 plants, and the other half, so another 10 plants, we left in the field to assess the bolting. So any plants that started to bolt, we noted it and then rogued it because we're planning on saving seed from these lines. So we don't want the ones that bolt early. We want the ones with genetics that bolt late. So we rogued them. Uh, we did that for probably the first three out of 10 lettuce plants that bolted early, we rogued, the rest of them we left. But we had a heat tolerance metric, which we standardized here, which was the first plant, when the first plant bolted of the plot, what was that date? And then when had 50% of the plants bolted? Because at that point, yeah, it's done. So, um, so with that metric, then we could say which variety um, had the latest first bolting date, but also took, took long enough for their population to end up 50% bolted. And, and we decided on the top four varieties and we saved seed from each one. And the seed from this is being planted out uh, at the farmer's field in central New Mexico this year. And we asked him to plant in his latest time uh, to see which one of these of the saved seed would do best. So here's a, here's a picture of our seed saving operation. <laughs> um, it's a, so you see the plots, uh, these little 10 foot portions are the, are where we're saving seed. We build little trellises because the lettuce tends to topple over as it fully bolts. Um, 
but that is our, uh, that's how we're saving seed. And because lettuce likes to self, you know, they can be that close to each other and it's probably gonna be fine. Um, they won't cross with each other. But uh, yeah, so we, we saved seed from the best ones and we're sort of hoping that genetically and epigenetically, they are adapting to a heat tolerance. And we're gonna see what happens as we're planting it out in his field. Uh, but we're also planting it here in Las Cruces again. So we're actually doing a little lettuce breeding project down here as well. And uh, yeah, so in summary, um, participatory plant breeding empowers farmers and builds community resilience, creates a management framework before starting the program. Um, definitely do that. Uh, have an initial meeting with everyone. Um, if it's not possible, yeah, one-on-one -on -one with the leader uh, or the leaders to each of the farmers. Um, discuss the goals, discuss the expectations, standardize the process, um, and communicate often. Because if you don't, um, especially over the winter and spring comes around and they don't really know what's going to happen, then it all falls apart. So you have to communicate, you have to be in connection as much as you can. Um, and yeah, I think that's uh, about it. I will do a quick plug first um, for NMSU Vegetable Extension. Um, we do have an Instagram. Uh, I had a student managing it for a while, but she graduated and now I'm, I'm kind of slow to get this social media thing going. So <laughs> but you can check out what we've posted. Um, also, here's our website uh, for any events. We do have a workshop series that's up there right now. Um, I'm working on some closed captioning issues with our presentations, but those are open to the public. You can watch those whenever, once they're up. Um, and uh, if possible, um, maybe Andrew could share my email with everybody. So if you wanna be part of our mailing list, just email me and ask. And, and then finally, I know this is recorded, so I'm just gonna put the references up just so it's there. Anyone can pause and look through these whenever they want. <laughs> but, uh, but here it is. I'm gonna wait a couple seconds. Okay. All right. Thanks so, so much, Bradley. Really, yeah, a really thank good you. presentation. Very, a lot of information, but uh, paced nicely so that it was easy to digest. Wow. Uh, thank you. I, That's I do have a couple get paid of questions for, for you, though. <laughs> The end for the participatory plant breeding part. If you don't, if you still have energy for that. <laughs> oh sure, yeah, yeah, great. Uh, but I I'll start off and please, if anybody else has questions, then just add them now. But uh, a couple of practical questions because we are of course hoping to start something like this in Norway as well. Actually, somebody tried to start one about five years ago, but it didn't quite take off. So we'll try it again soon. I hope. Um, one question I had is how many species or different types of projects can you have under sort of one per, uh, umbrella participatory plant breeding project at once? It sounds to me like you had at least four or five different projects there. Were they yeah. all under the same management? Uh, and sort of main question is like, what, what would you give it, what would your advice be for like where to limit it? How many projects? Well, here's what I'd say, um, because we're just starting out. It's actually just been me <laughs> managing them all. Um, yeah. But uh, they're all they're all on a relatively small scale, um, and they all like some of them. I'd say about half of them already have some seed saving experience. So, so it's it's mostly about you know just keeping up with them, um, but also helping you know providing resources. Um, and in putting something together in a nice plan. Uh, but I would say, you know, there are other participatory breeding projects like um, Novik is another one that's up in um, north, Northwest of the US, N-O-V-I-C. Um, they do participatory plant breeding and that was, that's more of like a one-on-one -on -one with a breeder and a farmer. Um, so you could do it that way. Uh, but for me, it was it was totally fine to do like up to six 
Um, I've been doing five and it's, it's fine. Um, because you know, that's, this is my full-time job. So it works. Um, like I have other things going on with our chili breeding project here, but it sort of mixes in with, with what I have going on. So, um, I guess that's all I'd have to say with that. If, uh, if you're doing it large scale, um, like if a farmer wants to get involved and they have acres and acres, um, hectares, <laughs> um, then, then yes, that would be like a one-on-one -on -one project um, where uh, the expert would help uh, coordinate with what's going on. Um, yeah, that's all I'd have to say about that. <laughs> Do you think that uh, a university or institution should sort of always be at the core of a participatory plant breeding project, or can it just be a group of plant breeders that sort of cooperate? No, I, I don't think it has to be a university at all. Um, as long as there's people willing to do it, you know, at least for a university, you know, it's a place that can provide the resources um, to pay someone to be you know, a full-time leader of it. Uh, so that's, that'd be the only thing, but also if you, if you have a, a network, that's, you know, there's enough savvy plant breeders that are farmers. Um, I think it's totally possible that you could just do it on your own. <laughs> Let's see why not. Was it hard to get funding for it or was that fairly straightforward? No, it was, it was, it was relatively simple. It was a uh, first time I applied and got it. It's a relatively small a bit of funding though it's a it's enough to pay for the stipends for the farmers and the travel and the equipment um a little bit for one student to work three months out of the year in the summer um so it's not enough to pay uh me full time but mm -hmm. but it's enough to make it happen um nice. yeah one other question that I had about data management. This is going to be my last question and somebody else can ask. But uh, about data management, you're talking about the need for it to be centralized. And my question there is, does the data collection also need to be centralized? Like, did you actually have to go out into the field and do the collection yourself? Or was were you able to have mm -hmm. one person collecting data per site? Or how, how did you do that? Well, for that scenario, I actually had the, um, if I wasn't able to go out there, which I usually wasn't, especially last year, um, they would collect the farmers would collect the data themselves mm -hmm. um, as long as you you know provide a worksheet or or what what exactly they're looking for um they were pretty happy to to go ahead and just take the measurements and then email it to me mm -hmm. okay uh, Ranil, i see you have your hand up uh, i wonder how you got in contact with the the farmers were you like did you know them from before uh, how did you get them interested in uh, doing this right yeah so uh well i had some people that had connections um like friends of theirs that are farmers um that were already interested in seed saving like they were in seed saving communities so it was really easy to get their attention um others you know i've just built relationships with uh, over time after, you know, I work in extension, so we do farm visits, we do, uh, we consult, you know, whenever farmers have questions. So, so with those people, I just asked them um, if they were interested in breeding for a special variety for their, for their field. So, yeah. Did they all have like special varieties they wanted to, to, um read on and and, uh, and work with or, or were, were it just normal plants normal it was uh so it, it's all it was all very different um for so four of them they all are breeding their own variety of chili pepper so so for for my uh, the network i have yeah everybody has their own specific goal um, I think as, as it progresses, it could be more of a, an exchange, but right now it's, everybody's working on their, their own specific variety. The one that's a little more collaborative between 
the university and his farm is that lettuce project that I talked about. Um, that one's a little more open. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it all it all depends. And also, you know, if it was it was tough because it was uh, last year was hard to meet in person. <laughs> and we had plans to meet in person and sort of put together uh, overarching goals that we might be able to share between. But that's actually only happening now this year. Um, I think we'll be able to exchange seed between each other at this point. Um, and anything else to note? Uh, hmm, no, I think that's all I got to go. Can I just ask one more thing? Uh, do you think it was necessary that they were farmers? It, it was farms, so they, it was, um, they had big enough uh, areas mm. to work to that's a that's a good point. Um, for me, I was I was focusing on the small market grower, so someone who is is weekly selling their produce um, either at a farm stand or to a small supplier, um, and that was my focus. Uh, so I'm actually not striving to find larger growers, uh, but I think I think the scale is all up to the program. I think you could. You could do smaller, um, like gardeners. I just uh, the scale to, you know, produce enough variation in the population, or to maintain uh, a healthy like genetic variation in a population, kind of depends on what you're growing. So yes, I think a backyard gardener could do lettuce. They could do beans. Um, but corn or anything like that, you need a little more space. Um, that's all I'd say. Okay, thanks. Yeah. There is one question that's in Norwegian, but it's, uh, I'll translate it. It's probably gonna be hard for you to answer, but it says, um, I wonder if there is a place where there's an overview of, of how big of a distance there has to be between different uh, kinds of plants and how many plants are, uh, recommended uh i can just add quickly there that we're going to do one uh, another uh one of these zooms just on brassicas and it's going to be a norwegian swedish and danish collaboration it'll be held by ula who's the head of the swedish brassica guild and me the head of the norwegian brassica guild and then uh gertz who's the head of the danish brassica guild and we will be creating exactly that kind of an overview for brassicas but okay. I'm, I'm supposing that the, the answer to that, at least from my perspective, is it depends on what family you're talking about. And there's endless amounts of families. So, you know, you really need to first ask yourself, what family am I looking for? And then you you can find those types of overview, overviews. I yeah. Know, Bradley, if you have any suggestions for other places to get that. I actually do. Um, mentioned it way back. Where am I? <laughs> Here. Um, if you can find this on the internet, uh, this is right. pretty good for a general overview. Pretty much exactly what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Seedalliance.org. Um, it's called Seed Saving Guide for Gardeners and Farmers. Um, really great resource. There's this, yep, this table at the end of it is uh, pretty much what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> Minimum isolation distance for home use. Commercial production is more like if you're, you know, a certified variety that you're selling, um, you want to be a little further away. And it's all in our, our funky measurements. So deal with that. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, there's there a lot of good uh, references in this presentation as well. And the, the presentation will, or the whole uh, webinar will be put out on our YouTube channel. And then I'll also send, if it's okay with you, Bradley, that I send out the presentation to everybody who attended so that they have that as well. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks so much, Bradley. This was really high, high quality information and you're a really good teacher. It's easy to understand, very awesome. enjoyable. And yeah, thanks so much. All right, well, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Yeah, maybe we'll right. correspond soon. <laughs> Definitely.
Okay. All right. Well, you take care. Yeah, you too. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night. Thank you.